and the stage is over to you sir Ashok Ratan, Dr. Bhavna Prashar, and Engineer Dolly Basin. And for chairing this session, I would like to have Professor Dr. Jasila Maji as a chairperson, Dr. Baba Tosh Das to be the chairperson for this session. Sir, please come forward. Dr. Anu, please join as a chairperson for this session. And Dr. Deepthi Pandita will join in a short while. Dr. Deepthi, ma'am, please join as a chairperson for this session. So the first panelist I would like to invite is Professor Ashok Ratan. He is MD, MAMS. He is a medical microbiologist by profession and a Commonwealth Fellow. He also received APJ Abdul Kalam Award for Lifetime Contribution to Medical Sciences. Currently, he is Chairman, Medical Committee and Quality of Redcliffe Laboratories. He is also an online professor and mentor for African Health Research Organization University running from Glasgow, Scotland. So he is going to talk on Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare. I welcome you, sir, on the dice. Thank you, respected chairpersons and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have a lot of interest in artificial intelligence, but no knowledge. So I thought I would use this opportunity to learn along with you about artificial intelligence and what it can do. I have a lot of respect for natural intelligence, but artificial intelligence seems to offer a lot of interest. So I want to start with the students, since we both are learning together. Have you heard of OpenAI? Has anybody heard from the students? Anybody heard of <coughs> OpenAI? No. Okay. What about Chat GPT? You have? Have you used it? Okay. Because uh, Chat GPT was released on 30th November 2022. And in the 41 days that it's been in, it's freely available, completely free of use. And there are more than 1 million users for chat GPT. So I'm slightly surprised that the youngsters who are much faster than us, I have downloaded and of course, I know somebody else who has that GPT. But it will make you right. It will help you use artificial intelligence. So with that beginning, let's see what, uh, as I said, this is my journey of learning something because I did listen to a, 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 a lecture by, uh, by, uh, by Sari. Uh, she's She's based in, uh, in Johns Hopkins and they use artificial intelligence to identify persons who have sepsis 24 hours before the clinicians said they have sepsis. You know, if you have 24 hours forewarning, you can save lives mm. because when sepsis occurs, about 50% mortality is there. So if you have 24 hours, then naturally I wrote to her first, and then she said she's going to work with Apollo. And then 
uh, we we are looking for other partners that we need to we are doing the test that we are doing here if we can give 24 hour advantage to our clinician then you can save many persons so that's where i started then reading about artificial intelligence and she is of course the trouble with india is that most of our doctors are in living in the last century they believe in uh, they want to work alone they don't want to work as a team and actually future is in the team so even in education where in india we reward the one who come first but in the world in real life world it is the team which gets rewarded no individual will be able to do as much as a team and that's why in the west they have team based learning in the team even the best person performs less than the team so team is always a success the <coughs> trouble with india or the the solutions in india with live and digital india where the medical records become electronic records so that the data is available it it was eric topol who suggested that creative destruction of medicine will occur when the records become digitalized along with that you get data that is generated by the routine lab like ours as well as the next generation sequencing data that you are going to generate if all this gets together then then the medicine will change and instead of doctors being at top they would have the patient will see you now you have seen that digital india has moved very rapidly digital world has moved very rapidly it was in 1998 <coughs> that the phones the cell phones were common place and then we shifted in 2007 to blackberry and now then um iphone became available and now you know we keep asking whether iphone 14 is better or iphone 13 is better and whether os 16.2 needs to be downloaded or we should stay with os 5 or uh, os uh, 15 and of course you would notice that if there was zero mention in 2004 by it there are 18000 members in 2000 2010 if there was zero zero mention in 2006 <coughs> there were 10 million posts in twitter so this is exponential the information that we are getting is exponential because sometimes you fear it may be like this the video is not working this is of course a person a uh, person ordering pizza and then of course you know they go this will be from the from youtube a person ordering pizza and then they say no you might want do you want the usual then he says no your cholesterol is high so there's a chat box talking talking to him and advising him whether he wants pizza and then he's not taken his medicine then he says i will buy medicine from there he says you haven't bought because the uh, the record from the from the bank says that you have not withdrawn money so he says i bought by cash so he says your income tax revenue income tax return do not show that you have another source of income so he says i'm going to go somewhere else he says no no your passport has not been renewed so soon all our information will be available and it could be used hilariously of course if you have used if if you have used google today then you have used artificial intelligence if you have used google map then you have made use of google intelligence if you have looked at what is the temperature if you were using facebook facebook also gives you choices looking at what you had seen earlier if you ask for most of these now have artificial intelligence so what is artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is any machine which shows any intelligence 
is artificial intelligence. <laughs> that is the broadest way. That means you ask a machine a question and it can answer back. That is artificial intelligence. Now, they seem to suggest that you can classify artificial intelligence into three broad areas. One is narrow artificial intelligence. Narrow artificial intelligence, that means you teach the machine to do something which it does, which you do repeatedly. You know that when you, when human beings do repeated things, they make mistakes. But computers can remove that. Computers can do repeated work without mistakes. If you teach the computer well, that is machine learning, then that is that is now you can teach the uh, teach the computer or the machine to do repeated tasks without making mistakes. It's been suggested that a radiologist would look at 50 X-ray films in a day and his time is done. He cannot do more than that. A computer will examine more X-ray films during breakfast than the radiologist is examined throughout the month. So that, and it is available round the clock. So if there is something repeated that you keep on seeing and you're looking at pattern, you can teach the computer how to recognize the pattern by writing algorithms. In parasitology, we look at the stool slide and looking at the shape of the ova or the cyst, we recognize. It's possible to teach the computer how to recognize that and do better than us. Then, so that's one. So the obvious choice would be that wherever we do repeated things, computers can be taught, <coughs> algorithms could be built, and then that would be narrow artificial intelligence. The IQ may be zero, but it will do repeated work very well, much better than us. And there's a competition which they had in Stanford, and they found that the artificial intelligence could read better than even the radiologists. Then we come to general artificial intelligence. General artificial intelligence means that besides teaching algorithms, now there are neural networks so that it's like a human being. Human being takes multiple inputs from multiple sources and then goes through different stages of iteration before coming to a conclusion. And then general artificial intelligence would be like a computer thinking like a human being. The chat GPT is also an example of this. And finally, there is super artificial intelligence when the computer would not only acquire all the knowledge that human beings have, but also generate new knowledge then we do not know where we are heading. So the computer then will do many things which are out of our control. And that's what we fear. <laughs> what we hope is that at least we will make best use of this. And I'm encouraging all the students to download chat GPT and try your hand on it and see whether it can help you write some computer programs can get you into your pathway for artificial intelligence. There were videos in this which will not run. This was in a way explaining. <laughs> you have another computer? No, okay. Oh, it's not, sorry, I didn't put it in slides. So, sorry.
instructional uh, artificial intelligence where your uh, machine based learning uh, learning can be instructional where you label the things and tell them how to do it or the machine can learn on itself the example they give is that suppose you write all the bat all the cricketers that are available how many runs they score how many wickets they take machine will then separate them out to two one where people have made a lot of runs and second where they have taken a lot of a uh, lot of wickets you have not labeled them but you have separated them so those who make a lot of runs are, will be known as batsmen and those who take a lot of wickets will be labeled as bowlers right so first instruction that the instruction part was suppose you had one rupee note one dirham and 1 euro if the weight of them were different if 1 rupee was 2 2 mg 1 uh, dirham was 5 mg and 1 euro was 8 mg then looking at the weight the machine will be able to now know that if this is the weight this is the coin that is there so that is how you instruct the machine to recognize that is instructional because you are telling them that this is the weight and this is the label that is there the second one is non instructional where you are giving them facts and the machine is then helping you separate the third one is giving a feedback suppose you show the photograph of a of a dog and it recognizes that as cat <coughs> then you say no no that's not right so you give a feedback to the machine then you keep on showing them that this is dogs this is how dogs will look next time machine will not make a mistake this is how machine so instructional non instructional or as a feedback you can teach the artificial intelligence then I 
decision and here in genomics we have uh, methods to do uh, using the DNA sequencing and uh, um, identification of markers. Is there a way by which we can combine both of these and if so can we have some learnings from there to accelerate the discoveries of predictive markers that we are looking at. So uh, uh, Ayurveda, just briefly I will tell you Ayurveda is called three sutra Ayurveda because it has three major axes, three cause and effect axes where it explains the relationship between the manifested features uh, of disease as well as health continuum spectrum with the causes. Yeah, this one. So, we'll start with that. so this is uh, Hetu. Yeah. Uh, so Hetu, Linga and Aushada. So cause and features cause to medicine, medicine to features. So these are three three way axes that Ayurveda describes. You can very well imagine this is related to diagnostic axis. This is related to more of a clinical medicine axis and that is more uh, for, connects therapeutics to the bio, basic biology. So this is biology to clinical medicine, clinical medicine then therapeutics. So this is a three way axis that Ayurveda described both for health as well as in the disease continuum. And uh, you know, for artificial intelligence, we are looking for two kinds of things. One is applying all the knowledge in a, in a system where which can be delivered faster, disseminated faster, scalability, reproducibility. So for that, we need to have a prior understanding of the things. Like Sir said, heat map of the x-ray will tell what kind of uh, disease somebody has. But that prior knowledge needs to exist that okay, this kind of a patch would actually mean tuberculosis. So whether Ayurveda has anything of that sort uh, is what I just want to uh, draw attention to. So uh, Hetu or the causes or the etiopathological factors, they have been described in its own terminology to culminate into the visible clinical features which is a he to to morphology axis. Now this is true for both health variability as well as appearance of disease in case of interaction with the environment or any external inserts or inter internal disbalances. And accordingly the medicines are prescribed and they are aimed at reversing that pathophysiological phenomena. So this kind of a uh, uh, cause and effect framework exists and based on which one can actually think of up, uh, developing AI based solutions. What we started was that uh, we, we tried to uh, work towards understanding this personalized health and variability 
based on the concept of prakriti so vat pit and kaf are the three uh, physiological entities in each of us in every cell it exists but the dominance of one or the other gives rise to a baseline basic constitution of an individual and this basic constitution of individual varies from person to person and that gives rise to variability in health this variability can be captured through clinical manifestations of features uh, which are re reflected in structure function activity response to environment response to stress but why do we at all bother about this because it is this baseline variability which contributes to our responsiveness to even drugs uh, uh, even uh, uh, lifestyle interventions like exercise and uh, uh, things that uh, were talked about so that is why we are more concerned about how we can do this prakriti assessment in clinical manner such that people can be a priori identified that okay somebody is more likely to respond to certain drugs in certain manner or certain lifestyle interventions or dietary interventions would be more suitable or desirable in some people so that's the uh, thing that we have worked and and we have simultaneously looked at the genomic profiles of these individuals but because i thought this is a panel discussion where i can only throw some Um, uh, uh, basic idea, so I have not got those genomic uh, correlation related details. In the sh uh, short, I can say that whatever uh, genomic correlates that we have identified underlying this different prakriti, they actually map to many disease related genetic variations, which are reported in uh, genome wide association studies. They also report similar uh, uh, to some extent with the. pharmaco genes which are fda approved markers for you know dosing of certain drugs including warfarin clopidogrel and uh, 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 other antipsychotic drugs and all so it looks as if that genetic variations matter to entire uh, we all understand and appreciate that genetic variations matter to this kind of uh, uh, variability in drug response as well as disease susceptibility but cumulative effect of those genetic variations which gets reflected in the form of prakriti is what ayurveda has described and we are here we have made kind of a uh, junction between the two so now the question comes why where did we apply ai or machine learning algorithm for uh, ayurveda or ayur genomics so the, uh, now all the uh, analysis that we do is on the basis of prakriti methods described in ayurveda which we have made into a questionnaire but now if i want to explain that what does that uh, if we were to collect thousands and uh, thousands of people's prakriti data using that questionnaire is there a way by which we can cluster those individuals into certain groups and if those groups will have corresponding genomic variability which will have an impact on choice of drug or dosing of the drug so that is what we have done so we have done uh, looked at the uh, population different populations across country classified them on the basis of prakriti developed them into seven prakriti groups and then uh, applied a genomics approach where we take uh, peripheral blood samples to look for uh, genomic markers whole genome transcriptome whole exome sequencing and uh, uh, even metabolic uh, uh, profile biochemical profile and we also have now parallelly doing physiological readouts such as heart rate variability lung function skin parameters and stuff like that so the question is whether there is any way one can structure this method of classification of individuals on the basis of clinical pro forma so this is the structure which this is a domain rule based structure uh, for analysis of certain clinical parameters and each clinical parameter will have several uh, values and each value would correspond to it being a feature of vat or pit or cuff and cumulatively these things uh, decides whether a person has a higher proportion of pit features or vat features or cuff features so this is a inherent structure that the whole thing has now the question is whether this structure can actually be as uh, uh, dr ashok ratan was mentioning Uh, so, uh, supervised learning unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning so you give labels okay i know these 100 people are of vat prakriti these 100 are of pit prakriti 
others are of tough prakriti but i have removed the labels and i only given the data to the computer to find out whether they naturally form clusters so this is the figure where we are showing that unsupervised learning forms the natural clusters of uh, the prominent prakriti individuals data and when we overlay them we, so this is from two different cohorts that earlier one was a vadu cohort this is north indian cohort and when we overlay them with the prakriti labels there is 94% concordance which tells that uh, data really has a structure in itself and they are non empirical groups and uh, now the question comes is there a way by which we can shortlist certain features which will you know uh, which will make computer uh, do it much faster to analyze those data so those kind of things we have done on this prakriti data and we have validated one algorithm with the other with one one cohort with the other cohort and uh, validated those algorithms to be able to identify so this is the application so now you purely coming from uh, clinical phenotype based stratification but now application of ai machine learning to identify algorithms to be able to classify now where do we go from here we actually can now put it up at a scale we can give it to the population Uh, people can fill it up for themselves and uh, they can get the labels uh, of prakriti so that they can be you know told that this is your prakriti and you are more likely to have this kind of a dietary restrictions uh, more suitable versus the other or somebody may not require because somebody might be in uh, so unnecessary restrictions or maybe uh, uh, unnecessary relaxations can be also recommended so this is for the data driven approaches for preventive medicine that one can employ based on traditional system of medicine and uh, uh, because of the shortage of time and the format i did not bring the genomic correlate data but clopidogrel and warfarin both related this warfarin Uh, F2 gene related and clopidogrel uh, 2B6 gene related polymorphisms we have seen to be differentiating between pitta and kapha prakriti similarly other genes which are reported for you know, bleeding susceptibility and thrombotic susceptibility they are also partitioning uh, between uh, extreme prakriti so one thing i just wanted to tell you that in a population uh, extreme vat pitta and kapha people are very rare so put together they are 9 to 10% most of us are in the combination but these become a discovery set to identify predictive markers so that if those markers are identified and if they are found in anybody else using this approach we also identified the high altitude adaptation related marker and susceptibility to high altitude pulmonary edema related so the, these repeated observations on these data can eventually give us uh, a predictive signatures for classification of uh, people in, on a genomic marker basis this is all on the basis of phenotype marker basis So there are many other scopes for ai ml in the for pharmaceutical processes drugs formulations people can actually find different patterns of drugs and their activities because uh, ayurveda describes all of them vividly in their literature but uh, one thing that i would also like to so when most of the times when it comes to herbal medicines or herbal mineral preparations uh, it is uh, people say the standardization so Uh, even um, the finished product or the raw product if the <coughs> chemical characterizations have happened nowadays there are e nose and e tongue kind of uh, systems available that you train uh, those systems for those chemicals to identify uh, uh, to give that signal that okay this chemical is there you train the system to give certain signals so when you give a new test sample and if that thing is there in it or not it can immediately Uh, guide so those are the kind of applications that i can think of for uh, pharmaceutical uh, things as well but this is for the application for the personalized and precision medicine where we combine we can combine genomic based markers and effect of pharmaceutical agents and their adverse effects along with that we have uh, we can do uh, something like prakriti assessment along with that and uh, simultaneous developments in it looks as if uh, in earlier times also they had this kind of a worry as to why somebody responds to why somebody not does not respond to certain environmental triggers or certain medications 
and they will devise parameters that okay, uh, th this is one thing, diet is another thing, sleep pattern is another thing, psychological status is another thing. So that way they must have uh, identified, we need to just, uh, we are here to, uh, you know, un unfold all of it and systematically explore. And, we, and these are this, all I can say is that the basic structure is such that it enables uh, AI enabled solution development from uh, traditional medicine, which is Ayurveda. Uh, with that, I would stop. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. We, uh, we are a big group of Ayurgenomics uh, in the IGIV as well as outside. Uh, we have a lot of collaborations and I would like to take an opportunity to thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the enlightening talk. Next, I would like to call engineer Dolly Basin. She is a gold medalist in electronics and communication engineer and a knowledge entrepreneur for 12 years. She has a total of 37 years of rich experience in the area of R&D, IT, product development, consulting, training, e-services, and e-learning. She is a founder of Smart Edge, a platform for innovators. Under this initiative, she has inspired more than 10,000 women and youth towards technology entrepreneurship and innovation and help to prepare them for future of work through exp exponential learning, technology adoption and business ex acceleration. I would like to invite you, ma'am, for your discussion. Thank you. I think as a last uh, presenter, uh, I have uh, <coughs> Most of the things that have to be told has already been uh, shared. And uh, being an art person out, because I'm the only engineer probably in this room, and <clears throat> my specialization is in application of engineering into uh, the service sector. So <clears throat> I happen to really bring in a lot of uh, technology innovation in the past. And uh, when I was uh, <clears throat> working with the uh, a, a lot of entrepreneurs, I felt one of the uh, big problems that is there, that there is no enabling environment for people to innovate. And there is no reason why the entrepreneurs uh, <coughs> uh, really uh, not do uh, any major uh, product development because uh, there is no enabling environment. So they just pick up an e-commerce job the best of the doctors are actually selling medicines online. The best of the uh, people who are... So there is absolutely no focus towards translating the research into actual practice. And that is where I <coughs> uh, left a cushy job and started a consulting company. I said it's not possible for me to really do a lot of innovation personally. In 92, I uh, launched the first software product from India to win an international award. And since then, we have not got any product award from India. So <clears throat> I said I have to build something in that area and uh, started concentrating on the small and medium entrepreneurs and uh, looked at what the entrepreneurs are doing. What I used to make of people who are doing a lot of work but it is not being promoted and it's actually not going out into the market the way it is the tech companies the it companies actually form a company in us or uh, singapore or wherever and actually shift there and the the results don't really come to us in india so i said there's something that has to be done government might be doing something but that's not adequate so there are uh, <coughs> professionals who have to step in. And I started this Smart Edge uh, initiative, uh, under which we really started working on bringing technology adoption, focus towards technology adoption, look at those areas which really need to be addressed. And healthcare was one of them. So <coughs> I uh, started off really uh, working on this uh, almost 10 years back and now uh, in the last 10 years we've done some very innovative work uh, with the students in open innovation as open ai has you've seen results but uh, 
behind the scenes, there are a lot of people working on open innovation. I've had a chance to really work, interact with the MIT Research Lab and Stanford Research Lab to bring in some of the technologies and actually steer the innovation ecosystem in the country. <laughs> One of the things that we really did was basically during the Kumbh Mela because Kumbh Mela is something which actually allows you uh, to have a whole uh, amount of uh, data that can be collated and we really use that as a <coughs> basis to uh, work on. Coming back to the subject in uh, uh, today's discussion, AI in healthcare, uh, healthcare faces huge amount of problem and one of the basic problem is the kind of inadequacy of the doctors or the caregivers in the rural areas or in the areas which are less deprived. So we have to really look at innovations which can reach masses and there is no other way but to use technology. Also we are seeing new viruses, new diseases cropping up and which is creating havoc because uh, you don't know which particular medicine is going to work, so you're doing hit and try, but there are much better methods to do that by using artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can help cure some of these ills, and this is where the focus of my work in the last couple of years has been. Yes, ma'am. Even? Yes. So, uh, my job has been simplified by the previous speaker. Uh, thank you very much in terms of uh, giving the basics of uh, artificial intelligence. I would not uh, spend much time except to define artificial intelligence the way I understand it. It's a branch of computer science that focuses on creating intelligent machines. So we are basically trying to really bring in intelligence into the machines. Machines are dumb. And artificial intelligence is something that is uh, providing the intelligence to those machines. The AI systems are designed to learn and adapt to the environment. Now, what is that environment? You could choose any environment and it could really uh, learn that. And that is how the whole system works. What is basis is the data. The right data at the right time to take the right decisions. Uh, AI can be used to automate the processes and make decisions, which is another factor which really makes it apart from other fields of discipline. <laughs> you can also define artificial intelligence as a branch of computer science that focuses on creating intelligent machines. <clears throat> In general, AI is an umbrella term for a range of computer algorithms and approaches that allow machines to sense, reason, act, and adapt like humans do. In fact, there is a, there's a growing debate whether it will actually surpass the human uh, intelligence, and that is where we are heading to. The human-like capabilities to recognize faces, recognize photos, robots, all these things can now be done through the AI systems, through the various disciplines of AI. The beyond human functions could include things like uh, doing the genome sequencing, doing the kind of uh, <coughs> uh, clinical trials in maybe half the time, or uh, trying to do drug repurposing. These are the things that we could not do at that kind of speed as what AI can do. So uh, I'm, I've skipped some of the slides uh, for the want of time, but I'd like to really uh, emphasize that in initially when we're talking about uh, this thing it was only for ai was used only for engineering of making intelligent machines and uh, the processes programs from 1950 to 1970s this was the traditional area when machine learning came in it actually uh, spurred the amount of usage of artificial intelligence by 2000s we actually brought in an ability uh, in AI to really learn and uh, for being explicitly programmed to do that. Uh, today we are in the deep learning area where the learning is based on the deep neural network where systems themselves learn and the learning actually is an integral part of the process. So uh, this is how it correlates. 
a few things that I'd like to explain that uh, artificial intelligence is just not about data analytics yeah, yeah, yeah. or about uh, doing the uh, number crunching, but it also does a lot of other things which we have been using for years, but we don't know that it uses artificial intelligence. Everybody must have used the recommendation engine of Amazon or any of the this thing. This is basically what uh, actually is done with the AI as a backend. There are a lot of uh, <laughs> classification, question answering, all uh, kind of uh, text generation, text to speech, speech to text, uh, voice uh, chatbots, all these are basically the areas in which, especially vision, the recognition of uh, vision for image, image recognition, as well as uh, doing a machine visioning, uh, where machines learn themselves how to really kind of uh, uh, pick up data and uh, process it. So these are some of the things which actually allow for the health uh, ecosystem to do a lot of things without experts. And there is where lies the importance of artificial intelligence in the healthcare system. Some of the areas in which the healthcare ecosystem has really taken AI into <coughs> form has been in the cognitive computing space, in the computer vision space, in machine learning, uh, developing machine learning algorithms for doing some uh, jobs which are repeatedly being done and use of neural networks in deep learning. At the same time, the natural language processing, which was something which was very difficult, especially when I really look at about 30 years back when I was working with the hospital, we had a real problem to really have doctors adopt to really uh, uh, picking up a computer and inputting the data. At that point of time, the AI was not very uh, mature and we were having a lot of problem to have the voice to text. Today, it's available. Every uh, uh, child now today is really using the text to. <coughs> so uh, just to give uh, the context, uh, the So, uh, using machine learning, uh, one of the hospitals in China was able to improve detection of pos possible causes of blindness, typically uh, from 70 to 80 percent, uh, improve it from 70 to 80 to 90 percent. Now, this itself is a huge difference in terms of the, the kind of efficiency that AI brings into the system. Now, in terms of uh, the, this thing, uh, uh, MIT uh, Media Lab, I had an opportunity to work on this project, which was basically in terms of really looking at inexpensive <coughs> mobile uh, to use. This is a project called uh, Netra, which is uh, launched in India is iNetra. It's a, a simple, uh, normal feature phones being used to really <coughs> provide most of the eye diagnosis. Uh, at the remote areas. And this is, uh, there's a link there which you can actually see more of uh, about this. But this is one project that we're very proud of that the Indian team, I uh, know the uh, student researcher who worked on it, and I also know the professor of the lab who really worked on it. We had an opportunity to kind of uh, work with that lab in MIT uh, some time back. <coughs> So, Internet of Medical Things is another area which is basically related to AI in a manner that it actually brings an intelligence into the machines uh, <coughs> by connecting them to the Internet, which especially for medical profession is the biggest boom because medical devices which are equipped with Wi-Fi allow machine-to-machine -machine communication. So, you don't have to, uh, you don't really need at times uh, a specialist doctor. If you have a, a good algorithm which is developed, you can possibly train the machines to really operate. And this is what is happening in the in the telemedicine, in in terms of remote care. I know of doctors who are actually managing 40 hospitals from India, are doing critical care, pulmonary critical care, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, 
one doctor was attending to something uh, like about 200 patients a day on critical care. When I say critical care means every parameter that has to be monitored was being monitored over the 10, 15 screens that are there, which are giving you that data, including a robot which actually feeds them the medicines which were required. So that's the kind of intelligence that we have really achieved through the IOMT. The application of uh, the <coughs> IOMT, which is Internet of Medical Things, has been escalated by the use of the NFC and the RF identification, that is RFID tags. Because now you can, you can give a machine a number or a name and that could, you could really track it through the, their digital identity, which basically helps you now to really do any kind of work as what humans do from the machines. Now, security is a big sensitive issue in these aspects, and that is where there is a lot of concern. This is how the IoT uh, system components work, where there are smart medical devices and trackers and sensors. Sensors that can really pick up the biomarkers, help you to translate it into some kind of uh, <coughs> uh, something that the, the user can understand. And also in terms of, let's say, for example, steps, the number of steps that he has talked. There is a step tracker which is available. Now what it is doing is it's just picking up how many steps that you have taken, taking them into the input and giving it to your uh, system through your mobile application. So in turn, you have a network through which and through a middleware, it goes into the application and then it is processed and you get the results. Now, this is very useful for emergency operations. It's very useful for patient monitoring, even in the remote <coughs> sense. But more importantly, it is allowing you a facility of what is called personalized care and also <coughs> uh, providing you the feature which is very helpful in these five, six areas. One is the early detection of disease, because if you have the biomarkers giving you the inputs through your watch, smart watch, you can have a lot of early detection. And if there is anything abnormal, there could be a alert which can trigger off the necessary test or diagnostics, which again can be really fun. But your able to do is to really uh, expedite the, the whole process of the uh, caregiver reaching to the or uh, connecting to the caregiver <coughs> by observing these uh, details. Uh, it's also improved the decision making and I have a case study on that and it also aids in the treatment of certain uh, kind of products because of the decision making capability of the system which is does not have any bias. Also uh, end of life care which is very crucial which is completely ignored in our uh, area in, in, in India especially. I, I personally feel that is uh, one of the very very important areas in which we can but most importantly, it actually gives you a connected care, a complete continuum from diagnostic to the end of life. You have a completely connected network if you deploy your <coughs> uh, medical internet of things. So what it results is a better, uh, uh, it improves the entire uh, approach. Some of the areas which has really been years in which uh, there, there was a lot of problems, especially in cardiology, in radiology, in remote care, uh, using virtual assistants, AI chatbots, personal health companions, and uh, EMR records as well as the clinical practices, how they really get combined with the whole uh, area. Neurology, again, another area. There's some other uh, support processes which have really uh, come into picture especially in uh, dealing with the healthcare is in terms of the medical risk prediction as well as the medical data security and clinical trials fraud detection and automated workflow now that's very crucial for fraud detection in terms of the insurance claims as well as the clinical trials everybody here knows uh, how 
uh, useful it is in terms of uh, using AI. So uh, I won't go into uh, details. I just uh, share some of the application areas which are not very well known. And one of the main area that I'd like to focus on is the research and publishing. Now, every single document uh, that has to come out from the, the research of the various lab actually goes into the research journals. But where is the, the research journal actually getting translated into actual innovations? And there is where AI has been helping a lot in terms of really providing a lot of uh, recommendations. If you have downloaded a paper on one subject which is relevant to you, then 20 more papers are actually shown to you. And also, uh, you, you, can, you can have a plethora of uh, <coughs> information around it. And that's very useful for uh, institutes like this to really exploit the artificial intelligence capabilities in terms of their research and also publishing their research. A diagnostic and training. These are another areas where the basic uh, care continuum, the combination of AI and the IOMT actually gives you a capability to really provide the continuum of care where whether it is improving the population's health management or improving the operations or strengthening the innovation. So uh, one of the uh, statistics that I'd like to show an application of AI in medical research is very high. Right now, the kind of research which is available across the world is now available on your fingertip. And it's possible to really find out what other labs are doing and in that same area that you are working on. <clears throat> Most of the publishing tools actually uh, use AI. Another area which nobody talks about application of AI <laughs> is in terms of education and training in healthcare. Now, if today uh, a young 16 year old boy has a smartwatch and he knows more of what his body is having, and if he goes to a doctor and doctor does not really have the same amount of uh, confidence in the, this thing, it's going to be very pathetic. And there is where there has to be a lot of education, emphasis on education and training of everybody in the care continuum to really understand. And there is where AI is going to be very helpful by use of simulation, by using use of <coughs> virtual assistants, chatbots, and so on and so forth. Now, healthcare, uh, there are multiple projects which are being done. We, uh, a lot of projects that are uh, being done by uh, uh, entrepreneurs, but when it when it uh, looks at the uh, curriculum in terms of the medical schools, they are just not taught anything. That means the health administrators, the doctors, everybody have to really understand how to use AI. And there is a conscious effort across the globe to really kind of work on the medical education for application of AI. And uh, here is where a, a brief sum the kind of courses uh, for creating executive summary of AI implementation in your organization as well as analysis of impact of AI in the quality care in healthcare and so on and so forth. There's a full-fledged course which is on uh, healthcare in artificial intelligence and this is uh, trying to really kind of bring in most of the applications which are being developed commercially into the actual practice. Uh, sleep medicine is another area where there is a lot of work being done. One of my friends, uh, working uh, Dr. Ritu Davi in US, uh, she's come back to India now and has been working on this uh, uh, in 40 different hospitals in the US to do the sleep related research. <coughs> another uh, area I talked about is palliative care, but the most important area is what is called a smart healthcare ecosystem which is where there is a huge amount of emphasis, where there is a lot of uh, <clears throat> combination of AI and IOMT to really give you uh, a much, much better healthcare uh, provision. And there are some case studies uh, which I don't have time to really show, otherwise I documented it. 
and maybe I'll leave the slides and you can actually have that. Just quickly, they are in the uh, decision support in the perinatal care uh, with U UCG, USG scans, uh, for ultrasound scan for perinatal care, and AI in oncology for early detection of breast cancer, AI in genomics, and AI in predictive analysis with special focus on COVID-19, how Indian startups have actually worked on COVID-19 repurposing of their drugs for <coughs> uh, the thing as well as AI in the assistive devices and mental health. So these are some of the slides which I'm skipping for the want of time, but you can, there are links which are available, you can have a look. Uh, this is an Indian startup based out of Bangalore, working on <coughs> women uh, health, uh, Nirama AI, uh, working on breast cancer. Uh, she's won a lot of awards for her work which is a small piece of device which has been created to screen uh, women in the rural areas, brought down the cost of the breast uh, cancer detection at a very, very low cost. Uh, another case studies in terms of prediction is uh, the Atman AI, which is basically, uh, this was a technology developed by DRDO and has now been commercialized. And here it was basically the digital x-rays which can really diagnose the RT-PCR, it replaces the uh, RT-PCR kind of uh, this thing. Also, <coughs> drug repurposing, Inoplexus, uh, in the German organization based out of Pune, has been working on uh, these areas. Uh, here in Delhi itself, Indra Prasa Institute of uh, Information Technologies uh, developed an AI model for drug repurposing and the gene therapy uh, again, Inoplex has been working on the gene uh, therapy, uh, which basically allows you to replace a faulty gene in a patient's DNA or repairing defective gene by gene editing. This gene therapy has one-time treatment option for diseases like genetic blindness, muscular dystrophy, and blood cancer. So these are certain cases which have a lot of impact. Another area where <coughs> uh, assisted devices with brain-computer interface there's a huge amount of work happening happening here in Delhi and in Rurki and some of the other uh, uh, Northwest uh, institutes where in uh, US there is a, a group, uh, Director of Center of uh, Neurology and uh, Neuro Recovery. He claims that if I am in neurology, I see you on Monday and if I see somebody uh, who has lost the ability to move or speak, in 24 hours, I have to really make him uh, uh, AI-enabled uh, talk or speak. So this is the last case that I would like to uh, just uh, show. This is something most relevant to you. I probably won't understand enough, but what I'm trying to really bring, bring in that the connectivity across the entire continuum, across borders, across the thing is possible today. Right from where the clinical trial is happening to uh, a person who is resistant to certain uh, medication which is happening in one area to actually delivering the service in the other. And this, this is the way to really go, to use AI to really transform lives. Thank you. So in conclusion session, I would like to thank all the speakers for their insight into AI. But we are running a huge delay, and the organizer, they have another session to just finish. So for the sake of time, we are not opening for question answer sessions, but the speaker is here. So everyone is open to interact with them. So with that, just I want to conclude the sessions. Thank you so much, panelists and chairpersons for the session. Now I would like to call Professor Deepti Pandita for a for formal vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so we are actually way behind our schedule. So, uh, but this is a protocol. So I would formally uh, like to. Uh, uh, thank each one of uh, the participants who are present here. So, for, uh, 
so for these two uh, part one and part two uh, brainstorming sessions that we had in MSME challenges in pharmacogenomics drugs. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Vinod Sakarya for his keynote address and Dr. Rahila Sardar, CEO, co-founder of Genomics, uh, Dr. Dr. Suraj Ratnakumar, Mr. Govind Rao, CEO of NMC Genetics, Mr. Gurkirat uh, Singh, co-founder. Uh, and next, I would like to thank our co another keynote speaker, Dr. Babatosh Dash, and our panelists for the last panel discussion, Dr. Bhavna Prasar, Professor Ashok Ratan, and uh, Engineer Dolly Besin. And uh, in the end, uh, I would also like to thank all the, the whole organizing committee, starting from the organizing secretary to the coordinators, moderators, and all the volunteers present here, uh, uh, the core members of uh, Center for uh, Precision Medicine Pharmacy and CSI DS, uh, CRTDS, DSR Center. Uh, so thank you very much. So we'll proceed with the next uh, Thank you, Professor Deepti, ma'am. Now I would like to uh, call everyone for a group photo. All the panelists, speakers, as well as the delegates, kindly gather for the group photo. After the group photographs, the session will be handed over to Dr. Simmi and Dr. Rashi for e-poster evaluation. Dr. Kalicharan Sharma and Dr. Anoop Kumar will be the evaluators for the e-poster evaluation. Thank you. 